first speaker for the morning, Honorable Kenson Kazimi, Minister for Youth Development and Sports and MP for Grozili. Uh, we officially connected a few roads in the constituency of Grozili, um, Norbe, Asu Canal. Uh, that road has been one of the roads that we've been trying to get done for a while, considering the influx of persons who leave Castries to go into Grosley and Grosley to go into Castries. So this is expected to provide some relief as we continue to work on some of the other roads in the constituency. Kazaba is complete and we've officially started some uh, construction on the Emerald Development uh, Road as well. And we expected that road to be complete within the next month. All right. Uh, we also have a lot of work continuing with the Grosley Recreational Facility. We're expecting that work to continue and be complete by the end of May, which means the contractor is ahead of the current schedule. Darren Sami, we have ramped up our efforts to ensure that we have uh, Darren Sami turned over to the ICC and Cricket West Indies by May 1st. And so we have pretty much a 24-hour shift currently, and we'll see some roadworks commencing in the Kaimaji and Bella Rosa and Massad area as well. For those of you who do not know, we officially have a semi-professional football league in St. Lucia. If you've been living under a rock, we had some very, very good games in Sufre over the weekend, including um, Saturday and Friday, and uh, Sufre had a very well-attended community uh, sports event yesterday. We have this coming Wednesday, the Inter-District Primary School Championship. And if anybody has been following sports, we know that a lot of our athletes, they come out of the Inter-District, and so we're expecting it to be keenly, keenly contested. District 5, which includes schools in the Denry Basin, have been showing that they have been dominating this, this youth event for a while. We continue to prioritize uh, facilities in St. Lucia. 90 playing fields, so we continue to ensure that we try our best to do as many of them as possible. But shortly after budget, we'll see some commencement on a number of courts. We have 124 courts on island, so we'll be giving some attention to those in the more populous areas. That's what I have for you. Questions? Yes. Um, in terms of, of traffic management mm -hmm. for the upcoming World T20, I know traffic management is always a challenge mm -hmm. um, for these events. What are plans in that regard? Well, we have a number of proposals on the table right now. Um, the local organizing committee, they've been meeting frequently. We had a presentation for the traffic management plan for Jazz last week. I attended that meeting with events companies in Lucia, and they're looking to... The benefit of having Cricket World Cup in June, mid-June, um, is that we can actually sit back and observe what happens um, this year as it pertains to jazz. We have the full um, traffic management proposal on our table, and we are going to see what we could actually adjust. We're looking to have park and rides simply because of the influx of vehicles up north. We know, according to our records, that at infrastructure that we have more than 150,000 vehicles in St. Lucia. Uh, as I've said before, almost 90% of them travels grossly road at some point in a month. And so we will have traffic. There is just no way. What we're trying to do is to alleviate the traffic and try to ensure that it flows as much as possible. And so we'll be doing packet rides. We're looking at the CPJ area. We're looking at some of the other areas that I don't think it's my place to let the cat out of the bag as yet. But we're definitely going to ensure that we have as minimum traffic as possible ahead of World Cup. So question, um, would the water be considered? Um, we, we, we've used the water before for jazz, so mm -hmm. I want to know if you know, a, a ferry or a taxi could be used in that regard? Absolutely. Um, we have definitely uh, uh, explored the actual park and ride from cash trees, meaning you could park somewhere near the, the cash trees market and get a ferry all over to Grozny. It has worked before, and we're certainly looking to ramp it up. Again, this will be implemented by St. Lucia Jazz, and so that, that May event will really tell us 
as a Ministry of Sport, what we could do, how we could tweak it to make it happen. But definitely, we are trying to encourage as many people to jump on the ferry. It's a nice experience. We're trying to make it an experience for people as well in terms of um, providing information on the ferry, uh, a little bit of entertainment, a little bit of something to uh, you know encourage people to just leave the roads alone. And I think we're surrounded by water and we need to, as time goes by, explore more and more how we could make it cost effective. And, that, and I think once we do that, more people will gravitate towards that as a, a viable option. We have uh, proposals from contractors, um, the usual suspects, uh, proposals for the interventions um, along Beau along Belarusa, and Lafayette Kaimaji into Beau Seju. Um, my last conversation with the chief was that they were reviewing everything. They were reviewing the designs and the costing. And we're certainly hoping by next week we can have the commencement of um, some of the World Works ahead of Cricket World Cup, which would pretty much be two months in advance. Um, it gives us sufficient time. Uh, some of the concerns include the Norbert Road um, in terms of widening um, that area to ensure that there's, there's more flow of traffic in that area. And of course, the balconies we see along um, the, the Kaimaji Road into Boseju, um, these will be given immediate attention and intervention. So we're certainly hoping that that would ease some of the issues, the traffic that we've had in times past. I, I know there were plans for a, a possible roundabout near the Orange Grove area. Um, how is that going? Are these plans still on? Um, give us an update in that regard. Welcome, Choice. Um, <laughs> yes, we, we have had some designs from the um, Deputy Chief Engineer, um, and uh, we've been looking at a number of areas uh, in that, that vicinity, including the Computer World area, the SNS Plaza. Of course, we, uh, we have one theory that if we're going to alleviate or allow vehicles to get off at those areas, it will allow traffic to flow into Rodney Bay. Uh, the designs are in, um, the costing in as well, and so we've been going through the tender process, and eventually a contractor will be identified to, uh, first of all, do one area um, and see how that works, and then possibly look at two or three other areas as we continue to work towards improving traffic along that highway. Yeah. Um, also, in regard to the, the George Adam Stadium, right? Mm -hmm. like, the plans were there while I was still in the media oh, okay, and good. dreaming of becoming a minister to execute. So the fact of the matter is, before this government came in, there were absolutely no plans uh, to actually get um, some financing for the refurbishment of George Odlum. All you heard about was St. Jude and moving the nurses and doctors and patients from St. Jude until we got this Minister of Finance uh, with the actual vision, knowing full well that this is a stadium we need if we're going to have a Julian Alfred um, participate and bring the world into Simply Beautiful Island of St. Lucia that we needed to have a way. And of course, as you know, we've identified that the Saudi Arabian government has already provided the means for us to get this done. So in terms of designs, absolutely. Um, as soon as we are able to remove these individuals from Jude, from St. Jude, as a matter of fact, even before, because once we use a phase approach to move them from the hospital, we should see some works commencing on the, um, or the George Orlob Stadium. I'm going to say there is a lot of work that has to be done. Um, if you're going to meet the certification standards for the Olympic Committee, it will take some time, and so we'll be asking persons for their patience. But certainly, this government has been very proactive in ensuring that as soon as we, we transition from the St. Jude's Hospital, we can get this stadium back and available to our young people in the South as soon as possible. In Rodney Bay mm -hmm. and Brazil in general, uh, while um, it's been criticized as a really successful tourist destination, uh, some people are voicing concerns about, uh, how do I phrase it, uh, delinquents, bad actors being there, and of course the safety of visitors as well as the safety of citizens. Uh, and so as the, the rep, would you say that you're looking to add more police presence and stuff like that there to really help the place remain safe? 
Policing is a critical aspect of what we are going to pretty much implement, but I prefer a more proactive approach than the simple reaction of a police coming to clear out the area. And what we've proposed is a number of programs for the constituency of Grosley and, of course, all of St. Lucia. As you know, we have a youth economy agency. There are a number of young individuals in that area with business ideas, and we continue to encourage them to make applications through the youth economy agency to see if they can use their talents and their capabilities and be in a more structured economic um, activity, uh, entrepreneurial activity. And so we're going to encourage them to be part of that as well. Um, in, that, in that community of Rodney Bay, you know we have an uh, influx, as you said, of tourists and other people coming in there. What are some of the other activities we have that some of the young men are actually on the blocks instead of being in something meaningful? We are about to start a program in the community of Grosley that is called Dress for Success. We have had some individuals from that very same community come to the office and ask for opportunities to work. And we've actually found opportunities for our hotels and some of our businesses, only to discover that um, these individuals perhaps didn't attend an interview because they didn't have a proper uh, proper dress, uh, a proper jeans pants and a shirt, or a proper suit, a proper shoe. Um, and so when we discovered that, we decided that we were going to tap into all the resources in Grosely, encourage persons who have clothes at home that they no longer use, they've grown out of, or it's too small for them to bring it to the Grosely HRDC. And so we see a number of persons dropping their, their shoes that are unwanted but can be used by other people, um, their clothing, and we've been segmenting those clothing into the different sizes, and we're going to officially launch Dress for Success in Grosley after budget. Um, with that program, we're going to be teaching soft skills, interview skills, uh, resume preparation, and we've identified two individuals who are going to be stationed at the HRDC to allow these persons to actually learn the dynamics of gaining employment. I believe when we can remove people from the blocks, give them opportunities, um, then we can start looking at uh, increasing police for those who refuse to actually get on board with what this government is doing and to see how we could uh, ensure that the place is clean and more uh, palatable for these tourists. Right now, we would encourage these young men again. We are still searching for individuals with skills. We have a number of projects ongoing. Um, we've had issues where people have turned up for two days and they've actually gone back uh, simply because a lot of our people, they want money and not necessarily work. We, have, we are looking for laborers at the Darren Sammy Cricket Grounds. We are looking for um, certain skills at the Grosely Police Station that is being constructed and of course at the rehab, uh, the Grosely Rehabilitation um, Area at Pigeon Point. And so we do have employment opportunities for young men and women, and we continue to encourage them to come to the office, bring your ID, bring your information, let us know what skills you have so we can place them in something meaningful. Absolutely. As part of the High Performance Center, we currently have John Eugene, who is the head coach of the High Performance Center in India, um, with the St. Lucia, well, the Punjab Kings. But uh, the Kings have been gravitating towards ensuring that we, our development programs in the sport of cricket is definitely um, given additional attention and financing and support. And so we're certainly uh, looking forward to Cricket World Cup where these individuals at the Sports Academy involved in cricket and the High Performance Center will be given opportunities as much as possible to interact um, with some of the world's best through net sessions, through, um, through mentorship and some, some programs that we're hoping the local organizing committee along with the St. Lucia Kings can actually bring together to ensure that um, young cricketers that are aspiring to become professionals can actually um, get into the mindset of what it, what it means. In addition to that, um, after Cricket World Cup, we will be having the St. Lucia Premier League, the cricket competition. We're hoping to have it a little bit later this year, October. In preliminary conversations, we've been speaking about how it is that we can um, have this uh, be transformed into a semi-professional league, um, similar to what we've seen in cricket, considering there's already that dynamic there um, which exists. How can the government of St. Lucia come on board to augment some of the efforts to make it a better and a viable option for young individuals in the communities? Our next speaker, Honorable Jeremiah Norbert, 
Minister for Crime Prevention and Persons with Disabilities, and also MP for Miko North. He will be taking questions on his constituency initiatives. Good morning, ladies, and notice you in the back, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, um, the jetty that we've been speaking about for the longest while, I am here to say that the Miku jetty has, um, construction has officially commenced on the Miku jetty. Um, we're making significant progress and sometime during the course of next week, um, I will be inviting the press to the official sword training ceremony for the Miku jetty. And we also have an estimated timeline of about six weeks, so hopefully towards the end of April, or by the first or second week of May, we should be able to officially hand over a timber jetty to the fishermen of Mikud North. What is that? A timber jetty? Yes. So, um, you would have remembered not too long ago, uh, the saga as it, related to the, as it relates to the floating jetty. The floating jetty was installed, and I think um, I give an explanation that I had no control over whether or not we accepted the floating jetty, because when we assumed office, when we came into government, the jetty was already procured. It was a gift from the people of Japan, and we had to continue with the project. As much as we opposed it, as much as we had our own concerns, the fishermen had their concerns about the jetty, the floating jetty, and they did not believe that this jetty was... Um, suited or it would have been able to withstand the sea conditions in Miku because you understand we're on the Atlantic side, we have a lot of wave movement and the floating jetty has quite a few hinges. So we had a situation where within a matter of about two weeks or three weeks after the jetty was installed, we saw the jetty disintegrate and break into pieces. Um, notwithstanding that, I want to applaud the Prime Minister because when I came to him after the jetty um, was destroyed, the Prime Minister did not think twice to tell me that we're going to find the money wherever it is to ensure that the fishermen from Miku North get a solid timber jetty. So it is not a jetty that's going to be moving with wave action. It's something like what you would see in Prale, in Savans Bay, similar to that. And um, it's one that's going to have piles. So it's not going to be depending on, on um, hinges. It's going to have piles sunk down, driven down into the bottom. And I'm hopeful that that would really help the needs of the fishermen, especially now that we've seen, I think about a week and a half ago, we saw the return of the sargasm and we see the sargasm coming back into the bay. That has created a problem for the fishermen in terms of accessing their boats. Some fishermen have um, had allergic reactions to the sargasm and they've not been able to ply their trade. So I'm happy that today, finally, um, notwithstanding the fact that I had quite a few hurdles to overcome before we could have gotten there, um, with technical individuals and otherwise, but I'm happy that today I can report that um, we're no longer going to be giving lip service and we're no longer going to say that the jetty is going to start. The jetty has officially commenced, construction has started. I think when on Friday, the part of the jetty that I think they built, the part that is on the shore um, <coughs> that connects to the piles that was I think, more or less completed. So hopefully during the course of this week, we're going to see the piling process we're going to see that start. Right. Uh, in your portfolio as crime prevention minister, I know, I know that um, your job is to bring together stakeholders um, to talk about ways to tackle crime. Um, the opposition has claimed that the government has not been listening to them in that regard. Um, how will you be able to integrate the, the opposition and um, how will you do that if you are? Okay, so. Um, Crime is everybody's business, including the opposition. And the Prime Minister stated clearly um, at the government house when he made the announcement of me give, being given the ministerial portfolio, he stated clearly that one of the things that he mandated is that I listen to everybody and that I bring all stakeholders together. And he ensured that he emphasized on opposition as well. So I will make a deliberate effort and attempt to ensure that we get everybody involved, including the opposition, um, uh, give them a seat around the table so that we can discuss. As I said, when St. Lucia is doing well, when, when we have less crime, we as St. Lucians are doing well. It's not the government doing well or the opposition. We as a people are doing well. So it is, I think, I will ensure that when we have the stakeholder meetings that the opposition is given a seat at the table. As to whether or not the opposition accepts, that is up to them. But I will ensure that, on my end, that a seat is offered to them. 
can we, can we not reasonably predict that the opposition is going to turn that into just a political football? Are you, are you prepared for the opposition to turn it into political, political football, given that it is an election year coming just after, but it's going into a hot season, but it's carnival, there's jazz, the ICC thing, okay. carnival coming up. Yeah. It, it sounds like you're walking straight into a political storm. Well, I don't want to presume what the opposition is going to do. I think I'm going to afford them an opportunity and give them... The opposition have said publicly that they too have an interest in crime fighting. They too have an interest in seeing this, the country do well. And um, we can speak. Um, we can say a lot of things. And, but the time will come when they will be given an equal opportunity. And if they decide to try to turn it into a political football, people will see it and understand it for what it is. But I do not want, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I want to believe that the opposition, notwithstanding um, the fact that we're on two different sides of the political divide, that the opposition would have the interest of St. Lucians, all St. Lucians at heart, especially when it comes to issues that are bigger than politics, issues of crime. So I said we give them the opportunity. As to what they do with the opportunity, that is left up to the opposition, but we will afford them the seat. We've had this the French as well as the RSS. Has that been Yeah, we've seen, um, as you rightfully said, we've gotten assistance from various agencies and we welcome all the assistance that we get. Not this time, I also want to say that um, I'm very confident in the ability of our police officers in St. Lucia. I want to commend them for their efforts, um, especially within the past couple of weeks or past month, you would have seen a significant improvement in terms of police presence and police operations being undertaken. Everywhere you pass in the city, on the outskirts, everywhere within the country, you would have seen the police doing their work. And that speaks for itself. We would have seen from the time we saw the increase, what we also saw was a, a decline in the numbers and it shows that the police are there, they're ready to work, our police officers are ready to work. And sometimes we have to augment what they're doing with the um, assistance of other agencies and we welcome it. But and yes, it did provide, um, we welcome that assistance because it did assist in some ways, but I am confident and I say that, and um, I say that and not to even think twice, that I am very, very confident, especially being a police officer for over a decade, I'm confident in the ability um, and the professionalism of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force and the other agencies responsible for crime fighting here. I believe that they can. The government is doing what it can on its end in terms of providing the resources, providing the training, um, giving the police what they need to combat crime. But as I said, crime is something that is bigger than just the police. All of us have a responsibility. And if all of us play our role, I, mean, I know that the police too, when they play their role effectively, that we will see a significant decline in our numbers as it relates to crime, especially gun-related offenses. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, all sorts of training is welcome, um, especially military training. And I know that the police officers would also welcome the opportunity to be able to beef up their skills, to be able to beef up their expertise. Um, we see the whole crime situation is an evolving one, and we, we need to ensure that police officers are up to date in terms of their training, in terms of their ability, they too are up to date. So I know that they would welcome it, and I know that it will go a long way in terms of helping the police officers in their efforts in combating crime. Yeah, um, from the, I mean, you deal with the situation, um, it's not a, a static situation, it's a fluid one. And if it's a situation where you do not need a million police officers at one particular spot at a time, and the police officers are better um, able to perform duties doing other things or, or, or they are sent in other places, then fine. So it's not a situation because, and we respond to the situation, yes, we have to be proactive. And what we, what we saw in terms of the increased police presence was a direct response to what would have been happening. But there's also a bigger plan to ensure that we put things in place to ensure that we do not, the police will not go, I don't want to use the word lapse. It won't be a lapse. They, they will provide um, the type of support, the type of patrol, the type of visibility as the need arises. And there are certain things that we don't, I think we're not privy to speak about here. Um, but the police, I know that the police officers, they do have their plans 
and I know that they will execute it in a way. I, the police get sad when a homicide happens. Because it's a reflection on, on, sometimes it's a reflection on them as well. So I know that the police will do everything that they can to ensure that um, we're able to keep crime somewhere under control. I have a question. Um, a lot of the time when we talk about crime, uh, we're talking about it in a kind of um, an adversarial way. Uh, as if there are criminals and there are the rest of us and the police protect the rest of us from the criminals where in civil science crime is something you do not who a person is right and um, then we have econ economics basically as one of the main solutions for that but we have a new cultural problem solution which I do, I'm able to I saw it jarring because I spent some time out on the island and I came back and I could see the young men, the white room, the, a, a relatively new cultural problem that feeds lower down the river into the crime, a, a kind of instant gratification culture. Um, um, and just a while ago, we had the honorable member for Grossley tell us that there is work in Grossley. And some people apparently want money, but they don't want to work. Which sounds like a description of the people who are going to be shooting guns and committing crimes. How how do you, I want to know what your thinking is about that? What do you think about crime not as an adversarial, protecting people from the criminals, but looking at the the group of people who are most likely at, at a higher risk of being shot or thinking to themselves, oh, I'm going to shoot that guy because of this. Because of something that an old drug dealer like Bonnie would never do. Crime used to be about money, and all of a sudden crime is not about money anymore. Crime is about like, my, my pride, my respect. I want to know your thoughts on that. Okay, so crime... How do you attack that? How do you... Crime, crime is a, a natural phenomenon, something that is inevitable, something that we cannot prevent altogether. Um, but we can take certain course of actions to ensure that we control crime and we control. Before crime to happen, they must have a window of opportunity. And if we can restrict that window of opportunity, then we're in a better position to be able to deal with it. That is why, as a government, we've not, we're not just looking at the, the hard component of crime and just criminals and just protecting, as you said, the rest of the people uh, from criminals. Criminals are brothers, are sisters, are children of of ordinary individuals, a person who finds, or some people who find themselves living a life of crime, are ordinary people. And what we've done is, having understood that there is a gap, in terms we've implemented several social programs. I think the last time we spoke, we spoke about some of the social programs. And what we've tried to do is put, give young people an opportunity, give them an alternative to crime. So that is why we have things like the Youth Economy Agency, to give you a real opportunity to be able to turn that extra energy that you may have, that extra hype that you may have, to turn it into something viable, something that can give you an opportunity for a lifetime. So we're looking at not just dealing with the police component of it, but also the social part of it. So that's why we also provide assistance to other agencies like Rice and Lucia and the other agencies who also make it their business to ensure that they play their part in crime fighting. We provide them with the assistance that they um, require. And that's why I said it is everybody's business. It can be a situation where it's a them and a us type of thing we have to take a envelope type of responsibility, a collective responsibility to ensure that, because if citizens are noticing, if citizens are, are seeing things happening and they're not seeing anything, and I would say, but sometimes you never understand what crime is until it hits your doorstep. And that is why I try my best to encourage everybody, everybody to prepare this and Lucia that our children are going to come and inherit. I have children, some of you here in this room have children, and we have a collective responsibility as a country, as a people, to ensure that we, and as you said, there is a culture, we need to change the culture. The culture is not good. No politician can come and change the culture. No one politician can come and just change the culture and say, okay, and make people remove that mindset of immediate gratification. No one politician can do that. It has to take the collective effort of St. Lucians as a people, to even from the way, from parenting, how we raise our children, the norms, the values that we engender into our children, the things that our children appreciate, what we do as parents, we have a direct responsibility to ensure that we breed or we raise children who understand the value of hard work, who understand the value of working for what you want and if things are not, things don't just fall from the sky and you don't get things overnight. So we all have a responsibility to fight um, the scourge of crime that we've seen in this country. Yeah, because then obvious point, you mentioned the rise of the crime culture, right? So I'd like to ask you, in regards to, is there any work 
been the many talks about increasing cooperation in the with working with schools um, or increasing cooperation just with policing and whatnot in the different communities where people would be um, getting their values, their morals and whatnot. So are you guys talking about that? Is that in the discussion? Yeah, like what I more or less almost on the, almost answered that a while ago. It has just one second. Uh huh. Okay. I, I was just to add a layer on that. I, mean, I was trying to think of how do we even reach those people because I write about that, but my partner Isaiah, who's on Jeremy Street with the water bottle that doesn't have water in it, he never reads those articles. He never hears you interview. How do we even reach those people? What 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 what? No matter what we're saying, they're not hearing it. How do we even reach them? Just to build on what you say about reaching. So that is why so that is why I said there is it has to be um, there are gaps, there are deficiencies and, and we must accept that in order for us to fix it. And that's why we had I think once upon a time remember Rise would have taken initiatives where they had the safe spaces and they would have gone into these areas where those persons who you just spoke about who don't read these articles, they don't um, look at television. They would have got, gotten first, and we use persons who or people who had been who had lived a life to become mentors and to deal and to speak to these individuals too. And we identified some of them. Um, we identified most of them. We work with the police. We work with the schools. The schools have been able to pick them up from early, and you went directly to them to provide that type of assistance. So it's not, and that is why we provide assistance and support to um, agencies like Rise, because we see or we know what what role they play. Dr. King makes it his business to walk through that same area on. Jeremy Street, they walk through Wilton's Yard, they walk through Grass Street, and they know these individuals, and we provide them with the support. So it has to be an en all encompassing approach. It cannot be one whereby um, we just figure we do really hard and fast. And we understand that, and that is why we continue to provide. And even with the schools, um, I'm sure Minister of Education will tell you that the school is taking, um, is putting quite a bit of things in place to ensure that when we when we pick up these things at the school that we can deal with it from there and ensure that it does not grow and mushroom into something much bigger um, I'm looking at the whole crime prevention portfolio that you carry and i know it's a broad spectrum in terms of what it is that you have to look at um for me i think sometimes we focus primarily on at-risk youth at-risk individuals but not addressing the things around the at-risk people why they become at risk for example um, the workforce, 2024, parents don't have time to interact with the child, so they are at risk because of their peer, peer pressure and the environment that they are in. Perhaps in terms of policy, if you look at how we could deal with the, everything around it, from the working hours of parents, to allow them to have that social interaction with the children and be more instrumental as opposed to hotel workers who probably are for 12 hours in the day and they don't have the time for them to be able to be part of the children. So, can that be addressed from that perspective? Yeah, you're, you're totally correct, and I know Dr. Ilya would agree if even the Prime Minister would agree that um, we started looking at from the um, livable wage, because some people have to put in so many hours because they just have to work so hard to make ends meet. Uh, and, and that is why, from a policy standpoint, that we're looking at changing quite a bit of policy to make it in a way where parents are able to spend more time with their children, um, and we can put in the institutions where children, as you said, we look at why do people become at risk? What are the circumstances surrounding at-risk people or at-risk youth? Most of them because they don't have the parental guidance that they require. And we're trying to put our policy in place to ensure that um, parents can are able to spend more time with their children so that we can see a reduction. Hopefully, we can see a reduction in at-risk youth. So we're looking at policy from a national standpoint because we realize that this is a problem that is bigger than um, just one department. It is something we have to look at the labor code, we have to look at, as I said, hotel workers, we look at the schools. So it cannot be um, dealt with in a piecemeal manner. We have to look at all the circumstances around it and figure out what is the best way moving forward and what can be done. And having understood that, I think the Prime Minister has an appreciation for that. That is why, if you look at some of the policies um, of the Central Labour Party, some of them are deliberate in their efforts to ensure that we can fix problems and issues of that kind. Okay, so as it relates, you would have known that I recently got a portfolio of persons with disabilities and I'm happy that the, even before I was, that responsibility was bestowed upon me, that even as a government we already started work on, I think last time I mentioned about a Taiwanese grant and we're working on building a national um, policy on 
disability. I have received quite a few calls from various stakeholders who have been doing work with persons with disabilities. Uh, the intention is immediately after the estimates, maybe between the estimates and the appropriation, to meet with the stakeholders because it cannot be Jeremiah Nobert cannot just decide on his own that he's just going to put together a framework to say. There are quite a few persons who are putting the work. We appreciate the work that they put in. They have an appreciation and an understanding for various components of disability because there are various disabilities. We have uh, persons with vision impairments. We have persons with physical disabilities. And their needs vary across um, the different cohorts of, or the different groups. So the whole idea is to be able to bring them together, um, have a discussion, and to be able to put in the structure and the plans together moving forward. The encouraging part of it is that from the government's position, we've already um, started work on a national um, policy for persons with disabilities. So that is very encouraging. And I know it's encouraging because when I meet with um, persons who play key roles as it relates to dealing with persons with disabilities, they express their excitement and their eagerness about this policy and they too are looking forward to getting their two cents involved because it requires all of them to come together and see because um, they deal with um, individuals with disability they engage with them on a daily basis they know their needs they know their requirements and i think if we can come together under one umbrella and put a good policy together for persons with disability so i don't want to speak to um, i don't speak prematurely on the plans after I meet with the individuals and we decide the way forward, then I can, I'm able to tell you what are we doing for persons with disabilities. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, when the news of the rebate brought quite a bit of excitement for the fishermen, especially, and knowing that I have two very big landing ports, Prale and Mikud, the fishermen were very excited. Um, they took the news and with, with, with great elation and when, if you were to go by the sea now and that is added to the jetty starting, that is added to a new fishing, a new washroom facility that we, I built and we're going to commission next week. So I know that there's quite a bit of excitement. I want to thank the government again for seeing it necessary to give these fishermen the, that level of rebate. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we now welcome Honorable Alfred Prosper, Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security, and Rural Development. Honorable. Good morning to all. Good morning. I, for the first time, seen so many people there this morning. That tells that our government is doing very well. No, you just on a long vacation. Yeah. Oh, I was on, no, I was on a short vacation. Anyway, this morning I want to just update you all on a disruption, disruption that we are experiencing in the banana sector. Our farmers are now faced with a crisis with the unavailability of boxes at Renera. And this is an, a problem that has been ongoing for the last three weeks. We've been in touch with Renera. And what we were told is that Renera, every year around this time, they are actually servicing the machines. But somehow, we suspected that there was very little or no communication with the private exporters. And so the private exporters found themselves not having cartoons to export bananas. Currently, we know the NFTO has a few thousand cartoons left. We were able to convince the NFTO to assist some of the other private exporters like Rajim. He was provided 850 boxes last week. But this week, the regional exporters, Rajim, and some of the other exporters do not have boxes available. But the Ministry of Agriculture took a proactive approach last week, and we requested out of the Dominican Republic 7,000 boxes, which we are hoping to arrive in St. Lucia by this weekend or very early next week. This situation bothers me because it's happening at a time when we have a surplus of bananas. Our farmers suffered from tropical storm breath in June. And since December last year, they've been faced with a challenge where initially it was a surplus of bananas. And now we are talking about unavailability of boxes. Now, that is not going to be good for our farmers because it means that some of the bunches will ripe and they will not get pay for the hard work. 
added to that, we've given our farmers 44,000 bags of fertilizer in the last few weeks. It means that those fertilizers will further increase production. And we are hoping that this situation, by the time our farmers are ready to continue their harvest, we will have resolved the situation. So this is not a very good thing for the sector. It is not good for our farmers. But we are hoping that this problem will come to an end at the soonest. The last information received from Winera is that they are looking at by the 10th of April to recommence production of cartoons. I just want to also let you know that Winera has the monopoly for boxes, and we may have to take a decision to allow maybe another entity, maybe Export St. Lucia, to import boxes because you're talking thousands of farmers are or are going to be faced with a challenge of not exporting the bananas between now and the next week. I just wanted to mention that. Um, does that lend to the need for more agro-processing? So a, a different way to utilize the bananas instead of utilizing it for export? That. Well, whatever we can do when it comes to value added with any of our, our produce or commodities will be fantastic. We have a facility, an agro-processing facility in Bamono, and you know, this facility was leased to an individual, and since 2018, 2019, this facility has been closed. We are in the process of putting out the, um, in, inviting persons to express, um, to express interest in the facility, because I believe it has serious potential for value added in a number of our commodities here. So you are right, and we are hoping that we can do more of that, what you're saying. But also, I think it's important for us to encourage St. Lucians to consume more of our bananas. Yes, I'm very grateful that we have a regional market. We saw what happened in the UK market last year, but we still have an available market right in our, in our region that we can take advantage of. But those challenges that the sector face now in terms of increased production and the whole issue of now we experience experiencing the unavailability of cartoons makes it very difficult for our farmers at a time when we are hoping that our farmers can see that the government is providing tremendous support to the sector. I remember mentioning to you all previously that currently there is a $10 million US project that is <clears throat> really about farmers and the entire agricultural sector. The 34,000 bags of fertilizer. We are soon going to be distributing 500, um, 1,000 gallon water tanks to, our, tanks to our livestock farmers. We are going to purchase 10 ice machines for our fishers. We are hoping to put one in each of the 10 landing sites. We are going to give further support to our farmers in terms of <coughs> greenhouse repairs and procurement of new greenhouses. We are going to be addressing the whole drainage issues in the valleys like Ruzu. And so there is a lot in stock for our farmers. We are going to be establishing a farm labor program for the next six months where we are going to provide assistance to our farmers who are suffering with, as a result of lack of labor. So there is a lot in stock for the agricultural sector. In addition to that, we are just waiting to give confirmation to the government of Venezuela for another 40,000 50 kg bags of sulfate, or what we call urea. So we are doing our best to assist the farmers because food security is critical, it's important, it's a global issue. And I'm certainly sure you've heard of the CARICOM 25 by 25, where we are looking to reduce our food imports by 25%. So we must take action to be able to give the farmers the support, to be able to encourage them to grow locally a lot of what we are importing. We are, I cannot give you a percentage, but I know we have increased our production. Last year, we provided seedlings to the farmers, and in in, in, we produced over 220,000 seedlings. That is in terms of the tomatoes, the seven listed as part of the seven crops, tomatoes, cabbage, um, lettuce, sweet pepper, cantaloupe, watermelons, and we're hoping to continue that effort in terms of assisting them. But 
as it stands, I do not have a figure in terms of where we are now, but I'm hoping that that figure can be presented in the next few weeks or so. In terms of storage, how, how does that work? Can there be a mass storage like say in the interim that you know, the is there any you know of a way where you could store some of this or mix of is there any mass storage that we that's a very good recommendation. And it's not just storage for bananas. I wish we had facilities with regards to storage of our produce. So there are times you would see a glut in cucumbers. There are times you would see a glut in tomatoes. But after the glut, two weeks after, the quantities are very low. Storage facilities would have been best to be able to store when there is a glut. And so there is a consistent flow and availability of those produce, rather than when there is a glut and two weeks after you have a very, um, very low quantities and most times the price increase. Now we are working with the CDB in terms of provision of some storage facilities for us. We are hoping that that will come on stream very soon and our farmers groups, our farmers will be able to store those produce and release them when the glut comes to an end. Honey production, there is a, 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 you know, there's a lot of this uh, issues with honey production. How, how do we keep this commodity in flow? Because you get some, but then you don't get Well, again, that is the time of year. A lot of our trees sheds its leaves, and the time of flowering starts somewhere between April to June. During that time, obviously, because of more of those flowers available, you would have an increase in production. But in the rainy season, yeah, June, July, up to December, you'd always get a difference in terms of availability of flowers. But now, during this time, it's always the time when production increases, but it drops in the rainy season. But we are doing very well with honey. You, you remember just a few weeks ago, we were one of the best in terms of honey quality. And this young guy from Sufre got the award. We are doing well, but we just have to continue providing the support to the farmers. Last year in the budget, we, there was an approval of $300,000 for honey, and we were able to give support to our farmers in terms of trading, etc. I want us to take advantage of it because our honey is considered one of the best in the region, and we need to take advantage in terms of marketing opportunities to ensure that we can you know, boost that sector. Following up on the honey question, uh, there's a, uh, some movement in Trinidad towards letting, uh, to letting, okay, for letting imported honey from outside of the region be purchased and sold in Trinidad. Trinidad is part of CARICOM, it's part of CSME, it's one of our biggest trading partners. We have uh, our main, our biggest supermarket in San Lucia is essential. Mm -hmm. And Trinidad is that soon, right? Mm -hmm. um, which seems to open a window for inferior honey products from the United Other States countries. that are filled with corn syrup and all kinds of nonsense, that are not pure honey at all, but being sold legally as honey. There's a window now for that stuff to be coming in here. Are, we, are, we, how are, are you aware of this? How are but we I do not, ourselves? I that? do not know that we, can, we, 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 cannot, we, we cannot import honey into St. Lucia. So that the will that? not be able to do that? I am not sure it would, yeah. because we do not import honey into St. Lucia. But if it happens, I would be rather surprised. Okay, and then in Trinidad itself, if they're importing, if they move to allow the importation of inferior honey products from, say, North America, um, doesn't that kind of decrease our opportunity to sell? Yeah. Yes, it is possible, but I really don't know that is happening in Trinidad. I am not in a position to respond to it. That was one of the biggest but, issues at last year's honey show. Okay. But I know we do not import honey into St. Lucia. I hope we can continue along that line. It's by Yeah, we're not supposed to import yeah, we honey into St. Lucia. I understand that we have a, we have a market for dashi now in St. Martin, I think. It is the commerce minister said something about We have markets for a lot of our produce, you know. Antigua import a lot of produce from St. Lucia and other parts of the Caribbean. We have markets all over the region. What becomes or is a major problem for us is shipping.
So for example, we want to move our bananas to St. Thomas. There is a market there for our bananas. But shipping will take almost 10 days. So it's becoming a, it's a problem for us. So the market is there. For example, there is a market for sour soap. We cannot meet the demand, the market demand for sour soap, <coughs> golden apples. And uh, there is one other commodity I can't remember. I've been in discussion with the exporters, and they are very concerned about <coughs> those commodities. So the market is there. And if the market is there, what I think we should do is to take advantage, full advantage of it. <coughs> Well, Export St. Lucia, Export St. Lucia goes to the region and other countries every year to identify or access markets for us. What is important is for us to have the availability, but it has to be consistent. You cannot have a market for dashing, but you only export once every three weeks. You want to be consistent. So in doing that, we must organize the farmers to be able to target that particular market, but we must give them the support. But it makes no sense. For example, we are getting an order for breadfruit in the US, but it's by ship. Now the length of time it will take by the ship versus the plane will be a lot longer by ship. So we are now in the process of looking at various procedural measures to identify when we should harvest and what are the various steps to be able to ensure that this commodity gets to the market without any level of spoilers, etc. So we have to ensure that whatever market is available, we have the supply and the supply is consistent. So what's preventing that? Is it the cooperation of the farmers? What's the, what's the problem? What's stopping us from? Because like you said, I mean, that's not the first time you said it, and exports and we share as there is a, a, a demand for our produce. As I mentioned earlier, the shipping is one aspect of it because you have also other countries competing. But I do believe there is tremendous potential in terms of market availability for our produce out there. But the level of consistency is what we must ensure that is in place. I know there are, for example, this is the time of year most of our farmers are replanting the dashing. So by between now and maybe the next four or five months, you may not have, but around maybe October, November, December, you have a glut but it goes down in the early part of the, neck of the, of the year. So that is what we, we have to manage. Because our conditions, we have two weather conditions. We're not in terms of the year. We have half of the year, rainfall period, where most of our farmers, especially those on the hillsides, those you call the rain fed agricultural farmers, they do well. But now if you go to places like Shuzel, you will see a lot of those lands are not under cultivation because of the low rainfall quantities. So we practice a lot of what we call seasonal farming. But what we prefer is if you have perennial forms of um, agriculture, so you know you have agriculture year round, and so you can be consistent in your supply of your commodities. Merci. Honorable Dr. Ernest Dillet, Deputy Prime Minister. Minister for Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture and Information. Thank you very much. Well, I saw a video clip going around uh, with this background. I'm trying to remember, trying to figure out which one of you all that made that clip. I can't recall saying those words at all. You all haven't seen it? You did? See it posted on United Workers Party. Well, it also cut and yeah, paste, yeah, so yeah. you could see and say, um, so the, for the avoidance of any doubt, I did not utter these words, and I don't even believe in those words, and desperation can sink to some very um, sad depths sometimes, um, I must say. Um, so. I think we're going to start with questions as usual. And, um, yeah. I have a question that I think might be as not as relevant. Um, we're on the cusp of uh, a technological, social, and economic revolution that we have not seen since the internet, the invention of the internet, wiped out so many industries and reshaped a whole bunch of others. And there are 
the reports are saying that more than half of the world's workers are going to need to be reskilled, upskilled or reskilled. Or for, there are a lot of people who are simply just going to get eaten up by the AI. A lot of jobs are soon to do just going to be cannibalized. Mm -hmm. um, what we are seeing, what we will see over the next, over the year, the year in politics, is more of what you just experienced, mm -hmm. which is where people like me, who are obviously not me, will take your image and your words. Yeah, yeah. We will put new words on you, and we're going to make them come out of your mouth. Right? How, I'm not, I'm not asking about the defense of how we defend ourselves from it, but how do we ride that dragon? Because the predictions are, it's going to be just like the internet where it's going to go up, 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 and then there's going to be a crash. Yeah. So people are going to suffer in going up, they're going to be losing their job, and then there's going to be a crash where more people are going to suffer again. Mm -hmm. well, are you, you preparing for that? Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned two aspects of it. One, in terms of how it will impact business, and secondly, politics. So let me take the business um, um, first. I mean, there's no doubt AI will become a very dominant feature of business engineering um, in, in the years to come, and it's accelerating. So it's going to be before us a lot earlier than we believe. Already, probably one of the sectors that is most affected is your business because you can get press releases prepared now and almost don't need you to prepare press releases anymore um, and, and stuff like that because um, people who write speeches as well will be challenged because you can get you can get you know challenges you know um, as a speech writer because AI can write them, probably be even more informed than you. Because remember, AI uses all the data that is online. So if you want to write about tourism and arrivals globally, you will have to go and search, do all your data research. It generates it because yeah, yeah, uh, it doesn't have writer's block either. So you, you are challenged as writers, although it's for news, um, but also to in other forms. For us in tourism, we're already preparing for it, and we've had training um, in the Ministry of Tourism for some of our staff in terms of the use of AI. Um, and at the level of marketing, tourism marketing, AI is going to be quite important. The, the comforting aspect so far for us is that at the end of the day, AI cannot really express emotions the way, say, a travel operator can. So if you want to look for a destination to go to, you can call a travel, uh, tour operator, a travel agent and ask about St. Lucia. They can say, yes, I went there on a familiarization tour. I know that. I know where they're selling the hot bread down in Tomaso. You, know, you can speak of em with emotion about it, your experiences. AI will give you a writer. Tomaso has the, the most creole, um, delicious tasting bread. You know, it, it will describe it for you in the most emotive terms, but it cannot express it the way a human being can, at least not yet, until they have humanoids who can actually speak with the same emotion. But we have to prepare for it, certainly in, in tourism, for sure. In, in investment, it can help us tremendously because in putting together dossiers and putting together portfolios, it can be of tremendous help to us. And it would be affecting employability because some people's skills are not so much needed as before. Creative industries is a big aspect for us because, as you can imagine, the creation of songs and even putting lyrics together, that can be done through AI. So um, you as a songwriter can get your first version from AI and just refine it. You know, and put in some of the um, the finer touches to it. So you absolutely right. It's going to re-engineer business, and now we've done it, and we need to start um, reskilling our workers to teach them how they can use AI to enhance productivity and enhance the quality of the work that they do. It will certainly affect employment in the future. Um, you know, just like now you ask your worker. Um, are you, you know, familiar with technology online and whatnot? And people have to say, well, yes, I can go and do research. I can go and do X, Y, and Z. With AI, it will be the same. In a few years, you'll have to ask anybody you employ in, what's the familiarity of AI? Can they use it? Because it will, it's just going to become an indispensable tool. 
for politics is frightening what can be done and, and you're absolutely spot on what social media has done for political campaigns is really revolutionized how um, campaigns were conducted because gone the days of you know writing up in the newspaper putting an ad in the newspaper um, you know and putting up posters you know so exactly you know what's a newspaper uh, at least a physical newspaper um, AI is going to change that. AI will create more doubt in the mind of the electorate. It will create more uncertainty and it will help cement prejudices. Because whereas um, journalists would take the time and try to write a story, albeit some of them are biased, but the point is they try to, to, to write a story, AI can be designed to reinforce just what people think. So if you, if you have a certain view point, you can use AI just to reinforce that and use the person's own words, comments, likeness to make the point. So you, you're virtually you're saying, look, I don't like you know, a particular person because he says he believes in A, B, C, D. They can actually get a likeness of that person reaffirming exactly that when it's not even true. So it's going to be frightening in terms of how you manage campaigns in the future if AI um, is allowed, when. AI, uh, AI, well, if you don't have regulations as to how it's going to be used. But even that is frightening because most of the major tech companies are not regulated. They're not. I mean, you know, Facebook, um, Instagram, and X, uh, and True Social. That, that, that Trump has, they're not regulated. They're not, and you know, they, they hold their whole purpose. You, you would hear them say that their whole objective is to change the world. They don't want to change the world. They want to control the world. Yeah, and, and they want to control it so they can make money. Um, so you are right, and it is it's going to be a frightening future um, if there is not some clear understanding of how this is going to distort our reality. It will be all constructed reality. If you take it to its logical extent, it will be all constructed reality rather than you know, objective reality. Of course, one can debate, was, was there ever an objective reality? That all reality is subjective in the first place. But that's a philosophical discussion. But in regards to regulation, right, uh, is You see, the challenges you face as a small country like ours, you, you are a taker rather than a maker. You don't make the rules. You don't make the, um, the configurations that you know, allow technology to, to, to spread. You take what comes your way. And for us to pass laws without even knowing where it will end up, without even knowing where it will end up, is, is quite challenging. And you might end up actually stifling the, the good because you want to get rid of the bad. So you almost have to always lay back and see how it's emerging and how other countries are dealing with it and then for you to be reactive almost. Because it's difficult for you to be proactive um, when you are a small island state like, our, like ours. How intensely are we pursuing uh, reskilling efforts though? Because it's going to come on as hard in the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think you'll see an acceleration of it as the reality really hits. Um, in some sectors, you have to start preparing. So, like I said, we have started in tourism. You're going to call us when we're skilling so that you can get the free train? Yeah, well, I, 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 I think. Because you have identified us yeah. as a sector that is going to get. <laughs> so, that's not as Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But for, for us in tourism, it's already at our doorstep. So, we already. And getting ready, you know, to, to um, deal with it, and, and we have to, uh, and we will see more of it um, in the next few months. We saw a recent launch of art in the city. Yeah. Um, I know that you are someone who will appreciate art, but not yeah. just as an event. I'm wondering if there are any plans to develop castries as an art destination as well. Well, I think castries has to develop um, in many ways, um, and. It is something that we have discussed. And last year for Emancipation Month, we actually unveiled the two murals. And it is something we push very strongly. And I know the parliamentary rep, Richard Frederick, has had a few pieces around the city. In fact, I will be starting one in my constituency over the next few days. Um, and, and we have to encourage 
um, visual as well as other expressive forms within the city. We have no choice. And we will be, in the coming year, uh, um, establishing the um, amphitheater in Serenity Park. Um, we're hoping to push with the church, um, the shrine at, at the at Diocesan. Um, we also look into do a couple of other pieces of work within the city. And we're going to start a, a project, um, storytelling project, where we will be erecting QR codes around the city. And visitors can just be able to get the historical background of the particular area. Um, so they, they slowly, quite a few things will happen. I'm one who still believe we should pedestrianize the boulevard, for example and to really allow it to become a creative space. And that will take a lot of doing, but I think we've reached that point where the boulevard has to be rationalized. When we build a boardwalk at the front with GPH, it for us will be a strip of creative expression, not just vendor selling, but artistic expression as well. So you can almost imagine from the Serenity Park all the way to the city, um, you will have that. It is still a dream for us to have a youth creativity park in Kalisak, where we can actually build a creative space for young people. And I've already gotten some designs for it, for what it will look like, um, together with an entertainment center. So we wouldn't have to be going to Pigeon Point and to Darren Sami Cricket Ground to have mass events anymore. If opposite Kentucky, we can get the permission and sort out the financing to build a creative space the writers can go and sit there. There'll be murals, there'll be pieces of art. Just a creative space where our young people and can just go and, and just be able to express themselves, whether it's a small drama group wanting to do a rehearsal, and rather than go and rent the cultural center, you can go in there and do your, your rehearsals, whether it's musicians, whether you just want to rent an office for six hours to have some meetings. Some of you can make it your base, in, in, in a sense. So um, there, there are quite a few plans we have in terms of you know promoting um, creative expression. And Castries is critical to that. I mean, like I said at the launch, of art in the city. Your city really is the center of your civilization um, in terms of politics, business, and other expressions. Your city is the, the pulse of the nation, uh, and it should be able to get that attention and play that role um, where people come to the city because it's a source of identity when you come to the city. Um, and I think we should constantly be promoting this. Um, I, I love street art. You know, I, I really do, because I believe in many ways street art tells a story of the people who live in, in, in the city or in whichever community it is. And it is something I'll always encourage. Uh, but um, former Castry Central MP, Sir Fletch, she's taken issue with this, um, with the shrine thing and, and the cathedral. She says it's um, some sort of desecration of what happened, et cetera, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I'm not, I can never pretend um, to be a theologian or anybody who's an authority on the Bible or what's right and what's right. Uh, I, I couldn't pass judgment on those things. Um, I leave it to the church um, to decide because they are uh, the authority on those things. And the church was the one who proposed the idea. Government supports it because it aligns with government objective of promoting art, promoting creative expression, and it also has a touristic component, which makes it, you know, align with our own vision and direction. So, if the church, as the authority on those matters, says that we want to do this, will you support us in getting it done? It aligns with our vision. I, I don't know that um, Sarah Flood should say that to us. I think she should probably go to the Vatican or somewhere and have a proper consultation with the people that can decide those things. Um, it's not for us to, to engage in that kind of dialogue. So I would say to her, with all due respect, madam, that's above my pay grade. Yeah. In, regards to, in regards to the city, I believe the city police, they, they said that as of now, they will be enforcing um, the urination. Let me tell you, you won't catch me making a comment about people <laughs> peeing in the city. So let me wish her well. Let me wish the city um, council well in that endeavor. Um, and yeah. Going back to the 
um, the religious tourism. Um, I know that that is a drive by the, by the government. Do you think that you know maybe hotels or, or um, people like that should add to the itinerary for visitors? Yeah, for so, sure. for example, regardless of what religion the person has, but mm. you know a church visit as part of the itinerary. What's your thoughts? No, that? of course. I mean, I I I remember saying at the signing ceremony for the check, you know, for the projects that, you know, I visited a European country, Eastern European country, former Eastern European, and where the Orthodox, Christian Orthodox churches. And I, I actually paid, you know, significant amount of money to visit a small Orthodox church. When I went in there, you had to pay to light a candle. I paid my five euro, um, which is almost about 10 easy to light a candle and to say a silent prayer or whatnot. And there were thousands of people lining up, you know, to enter. The church is an old Orthodox church. I must say it's, it's no bigger um, than the Anglican church, maybe but even smaller. Story. Pardon? It has, a story. it has a story. That's the point. It has a story. Those of you who have probably been to London, have been to Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is a fantastic church, and there is a small bookstore next to it where you can go and buy your books, buy your religious, you know, trinklets and other paraphernalia. And there's a story behind Westminster Abbey. So a lot of those churches have their story, and, and people want to know that story, which is why they go to those churches. And in our case, we have a church that has a tremendous story, and it also has a story that includes pain. Uh, and there's nothing wrong. Somebody wrote me on Facebook and said to me, why do I want to revive the pain that people you know, suffered that night and to remember it is, is so wrong? And I said, well, I mean, the Jews built you know, something to commemorate um, you know, the spin and suffering that they went through um, during the time of the, the Nazis, which is a painful period in their history. You go to West Africa, you know, there are monuments for, for the slave trade to remind persons. There's a museum, you know, of African-American history. Um, Nelson Mandela and Robin Island. I mean, many instances around the world, there are monuments and edifices that speak of pain, but it's part of defining and identifying who we are as a people. And, and I don't agree that you should not do it because it might have been a painful, you know, piece of our history. We, we need to tell our history and to be reminded of it. So I have no issue with that. In fact, I would encourage everybody when it is established to, to you know, visit it and see. I will visit it for sure, and I'll recommend it to everybody. Would I pay? Well, I mean, yeah. As, as deputy of the SLB, um, you have known that um, the former Senate president is the charges against him were dismissed. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and he said that um, he believes that the charges were brought against him as, as, a, as a way to discredit and embarrass the sitting government as a um, deputy party leader. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I read his comments and I found them very interesting, um, most interesting. And I hope that at some opportunity he can provide a lot more details, certainly to myself, because if what he says um, is true, it's a very damning accusation um, against the persons involved. Um, we, 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 we know that it is a constant feature of our politics that um, you know the opposition will always try just about anything. So if he says political motivated, it has to be him at the opposition. Right? It can be anywhere else. So um, I, 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 I love him to give me more details and to certainly sensitize me on it. I, I, I read it and I did tell you I was very um, intrigued by his comments. But he also said that um, the SLP wasn't really um, there during that, that time. Well, I mean, I don't know that the SLP was not there during that time. I mean, I'm always there. I know the PM is always there. Um, the Prime Minister has responsibilities as the Prime Minister, um, and he has to fulfill those responsibilities with a maturity and understanding and a department befitting a Prime Minister. And he always tries to, to act in that way. And therefore, any action he took, I'm sure, was in the best interest of the institutions of the state, uh, of which you know he's prime minister. So, 
Um, I, I don't know about not being there. We are there to the extent that we can be there, and we'll always be there for him uh, to the extent that we can be there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, well, there, there was some talk of adding some acts to the to the lineup. Um, upon review, I think we felt that um, we were quite saturated, and to add more acts would probably not be in the best interest. Um, so hopefully, those acts can carry over um, to next year. And instead, we shifted our focus more on the delivery of the event. One aspect we're really going to put special emphasis on this year is security and traffic management, because traffic management last year was challenging, and we're going to go all out to correct it this year. And the second aspect we're going to focus heavily on are the fringe events um, in the respective communities to make sure that a quality um, calendar of events um, are implemented. And you would see, for example, this year we've introduced Inspiration Jazz um, for Bexon um, community. I'm looking forward to this one. It's the first time we've had one of this nature. Um, Sufra is going to be big as usual. Um, and we're going to just ensure that we deliver, you know, a world-class experience. Ticket sales are phenomenal, and we'll continue to promote them. Oh, by the way, Carnival too. Um, there's a lot happening, and the bands are reporting, you know, um, significant interest in this year's Carnival. So, uh. yeah. Yeah, you, you, your ministry, <coughs> the set of you have, I think we already exported, um, maybe not to the same extent um, that we do say, okay, we already export for sure in music. Um, our musicians are increasingly becoming more international, especially in their performances and, 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 and the like. And we do, especially as part of Brand St. Lucia, the product that St. Lucia, we do support you know, the creatives to go out there. Um, we've done quite a bit in terms to, of um, some of the, 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 the producers for fashion. Um, only last year in Export St. Lucia had about three or four fashion shows in St. Lucia. Um, since I've become minister, I don't think we've ever had so many fashion shows in St. Lucia. And all of that is done deliberately to say to our designers that you can um, design and export, not just for St. Lucia, but let the world see what it is that you, you, know, you, you can put on. For our models to say to them, look, you two can be on the world stage. That's an export, huh? and that's creatives. Yeah, people probably see it's just models and girls on the stage. No, that when when some of them get contracts to go overseas, when some of them become international, that is an export of talent. Um, yeah, it, it just precisely exactly. So, but so, mm. what I'm talking about, we're talking about things like Jazz Festival. Mm. We use the local artists there, mm. the local models, and we bring the international audience to them. Mm. And what I'm talking about is taking them. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that is going to, you'll see that as a feature in the next couple of years or so. Yeah. It, it, it is going to happen. Um, I, and I think we're very clear in our minds, and Export St. Lucia is doing a fantastic job. First of all, just to understand what are the needs out there. I, I was in Dubai when St. Lucia put on a fashion show at Expo. 
and I, and I saw the reaction of people to some of the designs that we, we had on. Um, and we need to do more of that to link up with Trinidad, with Jamaica, for our girls and our designers, you know, on all models um, can also go there. And other parts of the world, for example, we will be having very shortly a promotion in Jamaica for Carnival. We need, now we need to broaden that where we can also show that side of St. Lucia in terms of, say, fashion and what we have to offer. So it has to build, and we need to understand the standards and what the requirements are. Um, even for at in the city for the art festival, we'll be having the um, art exhibition by Xavier, over a thousand pieces. Now he's already somebody of, in yeah, um, he's already somebody of some reputation, but the number of journalists that are planning to come to St. to cover it um, tells you the potential that lies in, not just for him. He's going to open the door for many other um, artists. Recently, um, St. Tome had his exhibition in London. We were um, the leading sponsor, one of the leading sponsors for that exhibition in London um, to show his, all in St. Tome, um, to show his, his, um, his, his pieces. And we will continue to support that. And we are available to provide support for that. For the Art in the City this year, there'll be a lot of training and sessions and workshops to start exposing our creatives to what is required to be world class. So they can start going to the Brazil in Miami and show off their pieces. And, and that we have to focus on now to prepare our creatives. And sometimes I say to the creatives, everybody says to me, oh, they need more money, they're paying, they're paying a foreign artist so much to perform for jazz and how much you get. And I say, well, boss, just ask yourself how many Grammys they have and how many Grammys you have, how many records. Huh? Well, I mean, that, that, that's, that, you know, that they will always do it. But the, the truth is, we have to say to our people to continue to raise the standards and we're going to work with you to do it. Okay, I, I just wanted to be a little counter here. Yeah. When, when people talk about raising the standard of the mm. um, Derek Walker went mm. on tour in mm. Mediterranean mm. and mm. with a play, The Odyssey, like one of our American mm. Somebody else looks at it and, and has the reaction. We think to ourselves, oh, wait, this is good. No, but, that, but that's, that's we not. We don't even know what no, goes until we put it out there. But, that, but that's exactly the point. Yeah. That's exactly the point. You, and that's how art is. Yeah. Somebody does a painting and so many people might pass it and dismiss it. At home don't know what and somebody looks at it and say, wow, this is magnificent. Yeah. And then now, but we have to train our creative. How do you capture that moment? How do you build on that moment? Otherwise, you, you won't seize the opportunity when they come. So part of it is not just having the, 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 the talent, but how do you prepare yourself? And we must do that not just for creatives, for sports as well. How do we prepare our athletes for when they go onto the world stage with the talent that they can break through? Because they also need to have some soft skills. They need to have some understanding of the business in which, because it's a business now. And, and that's why I'm so excited, for example, about the semi-pro league that the government has started and the prime minister really promoted together the minister of sports. We need that to prepare our athletes to break into that arena. Other countries, I mean, just look at South America, how they prepare their youngsters for pageants to win Miss World, Miss, win Miss Universe from, from family, their children, literally. Watch how they prepare their footballers, how they prepare, you know, the other people, because they almost set them on that trajectory that if you have the talent, you'll become international. So we need to start preparing with more um, semi-pro leagues. I wish we can, I can see one for, for T20 cricket in St. Lucia. We can have, you know, in different arenas where we start not just having events, but almost the developmental side of it to ensure that we prepare our, our people to, to compete on the world stage and to conquer the world stage. You know, Julian Alfred from All Indications is going to do the same, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, PM is coming. So hotels might look for interesting ways to sort of improve the visitor experience. Some of those ways might be to take unique artifacts and install it somewhere in their property so they can tell, like, hey, look, I have a hundred year old piece of. Which hotel did that? Allegedly. 
So what guidance, what advice might you have for hoteliers who might try to capitalize on idle, seemingly idle pieces of artifacts and taking it and installing it in, on their premises and then when the heat is on, the it. Well, I, I think it is, it is totally unacceptable. That should not be happening at all. But the comforting, comforting thing, though, is that there was no, no law had to be used or no enforcement had to be used, from what I know, to get it back. Once they realized what the public outrage was and the popular resentment of what they did, whoever did it, it was brought back. And I think that's, that, that's good. So it was terrible and unacceptable what was done in the first place. But the, the acknowledgement that what they did was an unpopular and unacceptable act cause them to bring it back, I think is comforting. And, and we need to do more of that. There has to be the public outrage and say, look, um, something is wrong about something, and, and for you to be corrected. Um, I think what, what's more striking is that if it is a hotel, a hotel company, might have, the, the, their thinking, their, their sort of, yeah, the audacity. So what safeguards might your ministry consider I don't know, to, to just remind the SLHG, um, don't interfere with, with, you know, with, with these things. Yeah, I will remind you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Okay, yes, good morning, good afternoon, good morning. Yes, Sorry, but yes, open, yeah. gentlemen, ladies. Uh -huh. The charges against him were dismissed. Um, he's saying that to him it looks politically motivated and as a stunt to embarrass the Muslim government. What are your thoughts? No, um, you know, we, we believe. We believe in the separation of separation of powers. I had no idea that Mr. Felix had any issues with, with the law, um, and I do not know when he was charged or why he was charged. I was informed when he was charged, and is, it was our position that Mr. Felix should be relieved of, of his duties at the time because of the pending charges against him. Now, I'm very pleased and very happy that Mr. Felix has been exonerated. I look forward for him to continue his legal practice. As far as I know, he's still a member of, of, of the Labour Party, and that status has not, been, has not changed. Um, <coughs> In the season of budget, right? One of the tomorrow. Yes, one of the <coughs> um, accusations I could see um, by some detractors of the government is that the government has been borrowing too much. That's what they say. First question. It's a two-part question. Um, how much has the government already borrowed? One and two. What would your response be to those accusations? First of all, um, we tomorrow is the estimates of. Expenditure and revenue has gone down tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll see the, the, the performance of the government. Just wait for tomorrow. And what is what happened is that we gave these these that information eight days before eight days. It's the first time in St. Lucia's history that estimates have been given eight days before. You, you know what happened to us when we were in opposition? We'd have got the we got it on Saturday. And we're supposed to debate on Tuesday. The opposition, the opposition, ha they have it eight days before. Secondly, we expect the opposition to be prepared, and we expect them to respond on Wednesday morning, as I did when I got it on Saturday. So on Wednesday morning, we expect the leader of the opposition to get up at nine o'clock and speak, like I did. We expect that from him, because he had it eight days before. I had it two days before too. I got it on Saturday. I had the pleasure of the police coming to my house in, in, with an old rider to bring it for me on Saturday. And then I had it for Sunday. And Monday, he, 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 he stated, he made his presentation on Tuesday. And I got, and I got up on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock and I responded. I expect that from the leader of the opposition. And don't give me the excuse about numbers. 
because I'm not the one who, who, who put the numbers in the house. The people put the numbers in the house. Numbers, the numbers cannot mean that you must not stand up and do your duty. So all the borrowing, all the performance of the, of the economy is going to be in a book that the leader of the nation can read and can disclose to the public what is in that book. On the 24th of April, I'm going to be doing the policy statement where the policy, as it relates to the figures I'm going to give tomorrow, are going to be discussed. So right now, all I ask from you is to wait and look at the results. I'm sure the leader of the opposition has leaked the estimates. I'm sure. <laughs> Two more years for the next election, the next not two more years of, two years of two governance. Years. But how do you see this budget? Because you know we intend to, you know we intend to win the next election. You know? <laughs> how, how do you see this free term now bridging into this next two years? You know, um, this year, this year, we dubbed it the year of infrastructure. But I want to warn you, inform you, that infrastructure does not only mean roads. I've said so so many times, but I want to say it again. Infrastructure does not only mean roads. Infrastructure means roads, buildings, hospitals, ports, airport, housing. And right now, the digital, the, the digital infrastructure is infrastructure also. I want to be clear. I want to make it clear that infrastructure does not only mean roads. So this year is the year of infrastructure. Yes, Yes, a lot. You're going to hear it. Tomorrow? No, tomorrow, you see, let me repeat what tomorrow is all about. Tomorrow is the country's balance sheet, the country's income, its revenue, and how we expect to spend the, the, the money. It's going to be in two parts. Part number one is going to be report on the year that ended, which is going to end in March, 20, March 24. And part number two is going to be the projections of March 24 to April 25. That's what you're going to do tomorrow. But the policy is where the meat of the matter will happen. It's a serious thrust, it's a serious thrust, and I'm sorry I couldn't attend because I was in the middle of my budget presentation, preparing for my budget presentation, but it's a serious thrust. But I just want to make it clear, very clear, is that this government has been very systematic in our approach to cannabis, very systematic. Make it, make it clear. First thing we did, first thing, we legalized private use. Private use, private use underline the word private use for marijuana at residences, at restaurants, in a specific area. Private use, first thing we did. Second thing is that we, we, de, we said that if someone had been convicted, we would take it off the books completely. So they would have no conviction, so their record would be clear. Hmm? That's already fine? Yes. I mean, for a long time, that once someone had a conviction for marijuana, they would be wiped out, They'd wiped out the books. The appliance would come off the books. Small Second thing, small coins of marijuana. The third thing we said is that mar mar we're going to look to marijuana as an export crop for education and, uh, for not education, sorry, export crop for a medicinal value and for export. That's the same thing we said. But the education education had to be a, a major part of that, educating people on the use of, of marijuana. And this is what we will be doing now. We're we'll very clear. But towards legalization, we have not legalized marijuana because of the steps that have been taken. So 
marijuana in public is still an offense. And we also said, I forgot that you can grow up to four trees for your private consumption. So if you have your backyard, you can go for four trees of herb for your private consumption. That is the law of St. Lucia. How's the education campaign as well? Hmm? The education process, educating people how to Well, that is why we formed a very good question. That's why we have the Cannabis Commission to go into educating people. If you notice, at the, at the, con at the conference, the Ministry of Health was represented. Because, you know, we, you see, we've been criticized sometimes when we do not profess to know everything. You understand? We don't profess, I've never professed to, to, know, to know everything. And I will not come to you here today, I knew everything, I don't know everything. You understand? The people who knew everything, look at where they put the country. <laughs> yeah, question? Um, This new K9, does it now belong to the government of Saint Well, as I said the last time I spoke to you, is that the French government they've given us a uh, a dog, <laughs> a dog, um, one dog for now. We're going to send a dog free of charge. They're going to send a trainer. They're going to train it. A local handler has to be has to be found, and we take it from there. As to the future. I really, not, I'm not sure as to whether we're going to one dog or two dogs. Whether we're going to have one, I don't know for two and three. We're going to have one dog um, from the French. Um, in the year of infrastructure, what's the latest on Saint Jude? Saint Jude, yeah. going very well, <laughs> extremely well, extremely well. Couldn't have gone better. Well, very soon I invite you to have a talk. Very oh, soon. I and uh, but take my word for it. Saint Jude is going very, very well, <laughs> extremely well. I'm very happy, with Saint Jude. And what about the UN, uh, international airport? Your international airport. What I can assure you is that we are not putting the country in a billion dollars debt. No, are we signing any contract? This government will sign no contract where the loan is tied to a contractor. And where, apart from the interest rate, you have to pay 8% on top. This government will never sign a contract of that nature. And I want to go we'll say that again. I'm going to say it again at the policy statement. The Huonero International Airport, the contract was given by Direct Award, the largest infrastructural project in the country, in the country's history, was given via Direct Award, one. Two, the contract, the loan that was negotiated was tied to a contractor, two. Three, the interest rate was 5%, and every payment after that Every payment with that interest of the five percent, there was an eight percent on top of it. Every payment that was made to the contractor, there was a cost of eight percent applied on top of it. Information that I don't have. Information I'm trying to get. So in, 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 in actual fact, the cost of the money for the UN International Airport was 13%. The cost of the money for the UN International Airport was 13%. And you expected me to continue solution in that vein. What did we do? We are government the principal principle. Work had started on the terminal building, on the tower, the control tower, 
we've continued, we are continuing it. Right? Because the idea of Union Airport started with us. That's something we said, even if you look in, in our manifesto. And I, and I always urge members of the press to, when you hear things, do some research. Don't just listen to, to, to the spoken word, no matter how eloquently it is said. I always urge you, young man, check the records, please. I always tell you, say that, you know, meet, meet, check me too. I may, not, I may not say it as eloquently as some, but check it out. Don't let eloquence and accents blow your mind. Check it out. Follow it. Follow the word. Listen to what is said. You're on the human report. Listen to what is said in the human report. Listen. We on record as saying human airport should be expanded. We were the ones who started the cut cup loan for the high for the for for the, 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 the runway. We were the ones who had negotiated a PPP for you. For you and our international support. So you know, we we are fully supportive. When we lost the government in two thousand and six, right? We supported the expansion of the United airport. We supported it. But we're saying that it should have done for a PPP arrangement, as has been happening in Montego Bay, as Barbados is doing, as the Bahamas is doing, as Bermuda is doing, as hundreds of airports in the world have been done by PPP. That's what we said. The government went against it, and you know what happens. But we are not putting this country for that kind of debt for an airport. But we are going to continue. This year, this fiscal year, we're going to be starting work on the terminal building. This fiscal year. But what have we done? We're going to be going to, we, do you know, the largest infrastructural project in the country was built without a bill of quantities. You know what? It's like you build in a foul cage and you put some blocks there, build it, and set the blocks, build it, and set the blocks, and that's how the effort has been built. No bill of quantities, no cost. It was built on a fast track method, they call it. The largest infrastructure project in the country. That's how it was built on a fast track. So pay as you go. You understand? And uh, when you pay, you pay 5% and 8%. That's what's happening, you know. That is what's happening here on the international airport. That's just a responsible, that's a responsible government talking about waste. That's what's, that's what's happening there. No bill of quantities. So here's what we did. We, we advertise for the provision of a bill of quantities. We went to the market and said, listen to me, prepare a bill of quantities for us. I think that consultant was chosen last week by Slasper. Then secondly, but there's a catch. There's a catch in that we now have, we we'll now have to have to jump the diplomatic hurdle of speaking to the Taiwanese government so that we can disentangle ourselves from the, the present arrangement. And that's the, that's the hurdle we have to jump. And that's what bad policy causes you. We have to disentangle ourselves. Because the loan... Why? We have to buy ourselves. I don't know if you have to buy it. I know you have to disentangle ourselves. Because the contract is tied to a contractor. The loan is tied to a contractor. And I wonder why these questions are not asked. And... Credible responses demanded. So I, I, is, 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 is it a fear of being said you're ashamed of it? You're ashamed of you? But would you say, would you, um, somebody take the accountable for, for such, such, you see, such that's a question ma many people are asking negligence on the part of the, of the technical. Correct me if you like, but you know, I'll tell you something. Technocrats sometimes work on instructions. Now, there is nothing. Let me, let me look at this word carefully because I don't want this to be used against me. If 
a minister of finance goes out and negotiates a loan, and he ties that loan to a contractor, that is bad governance. The technocrat is not responsible for governance. It's like I heard the latest thing I heard is the opposition is part of government. That's the latest I heard in the market. The opposition is part of government. That's the latest I heard. That's that's the latest one. That's the latest one. Um, but so that is bad covenants. So if I go to my technocrat and say, listen to me, I went to Washington and I negotiated a loan and I've tied the contract to that loan. The, 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 the technocrat can tell me, Prime Minister, you should not do that. I say, do it. He will have to do it or resign. If he feels so strong about it, he resign. In that case, the technocrat did not resign. That's the difference. So I don't want you to, so, you know, and, and this is why people, let me say about, oh, you're saying all these things, why didn't arrest him? Let me so. There, there is legality and there's morality. There's what is illegal and what is not moral, covenants, ethics, principle, concern for people. You don't legislate these things. You don't be able to call for this. These things must come from within. And in my policy statement, you see we'll have some policies that shows how this government cares about people. What we've done, and in the policy statement, you'll see where we're going as it relates to people. You understand? So I want to tell you, you're right in front of the technocrats, but the technocrat didn't do anything illegal. So we can't beat the on technocrats back. In the same way, I never condemn businessmen who get a good deal. According to what they say on the streets, if if you get a bois, you must deal with it. <laughs> <coughs> so I never get problems. You so you've never heard me, you've never heard me come here and criticize any investor. Never. And you know and that's the problem with me, you know. They can only say what they say I say. They cannot quote what I said. Just like, just like the deputy speaker. And you all allowed that to go. You all, you, all didn't, you all didn't correct that. You all allowed it to go. Some people are luckier than others. I never said, I never said that the deputy speaker would come from outside the house. I never said so. I said... The debit speaker can come from outside the house or inside the house. You all allow a statement to go, deputy speaker outside. You all just allow it to go. No correction. And you were there, you heard it. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying there are some things you must, you, you could say, because you see, you all have me on tape, you know. You understand? They can use it to cut and cut and cut a piece and take a piece and do something. But they can never say the, the exact things that I said. I never said so. And most of the things they quote me as saying, they never say the, the entire thing, and you'll not correct them. But as part of business, I have no problems. I deal with it. Deal with it. So I just want to make the point that we, have, we may have a problem to disentangle ourselves from the load agreement for the airport. But I'm sure the Taiwanese government will understand our predicament because we have very good relations with them. Yes. Some detractors, <coughs> opposition people are trying to skew your comments in the House I think a week of last week when you on the crime, when you said that there are some things that you know. And, uh, uh, let, me, let me inform them. I've told the police what I know. Okay. Yes, and I've told the person. I don't know. I don't get, <laughs> attack me for that. I don't get involved in, in, in operational matters. What well, I know, I've told them. And the person, the people who did what they did, know what they did. I wouldn't use the famous, you know, that I know, that I, know. I wouldn't use that, you know. But all I can tell you is that I never say things without knowledge. And anytime. The opposition jumps to something. There is truth in it. 
check it out. Anytime they make a good, anytime they go screaming, he said so, he said so, he said so. There's truth in it. Check it out. Check all the issues that they've jumped about. There's truth in it. So when you jump on the like that, they know why they jump in. But, I mean, this business is too long. Huh? No, I speak the truth. <laughs> and they jump. They jump. No, after this question. So when the fuss goes about about making a big fuss and tell the prime minister, go and say, I've told the police what I know. And that's all I'm going to say. You understand? But all I'm saying to you, there's a lot of hypocrisy in this country as it relates to many things. A lot of hypocrisy. A lot of misinformation. A lot of things that are deliberately said that are not true. That's all I can tell you for now. There's a lot. Just with, of, for political expediency. You understand? Political expediency. All the rumors. That is for political expediency. A lot of things are not true. People just say whatever they want for political expediency. Because... The, the facts are always there to see. And I always urge you members of the press to check the facts. I beg you to check the facts. I beg you. On, on the police, yes. um, as National Security Minister, um, there are, there's um, an increased police presence, I'd say, all across the island. You've seen them everywhere. Um, but in your in this year's budget, would we see or would you inform us of any allocation to increase the technological capacity of the police? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of it will come. We are spending more money both on physical physical um, areas, the northern headquarters, the custody. SSU headquarters, the custody suites, the the Fifal police station. We started working the Marshall police station. Um, so, a lot of work in this place. I'll tell you, let me tell you something else. Let me, let me make a bold statement. <laughs> With all the talk about policing and the St. Lucia Lair Party, we have done more for the police than any government, the Lair Party government. We have taken, we have taken more tangible steps to improve a lot of police services, both human and physical services, than any government, the Labour Party government. Started by Kenny Anthony and continued by me. And go for the go to the records and you will see. Go to the records and you will see which government built the police stations. All of them that's there. Which government? Check it out. And I want you to check it. You check it out. Which government gave the police the, the mo most vehicles that they ever had? Which government encouraged policemen to go and do degrees in criminology? Which government encouraged police to go and study law? So we have policemen who are, who are lawyers. Which government increased the, 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 the number of ma the manpower in, in, in the police force? Which government had a, a, a use of force policy? Which government trained more policemen in, in police matters? Which government? Check it out. Go and look at it. Which government has interfered least in the police force? Which government? So, the history is there. You see, the problem is that history is there for everyone to see. History. History. So, we know, it's like, I mean, which government built Baudelaire? Which government is building the custody suites? Which government? Yes, which government, which government is building Bordele? Which government was accused of building a hotel, a five-star hotel for prisoners? Which government? So, you young journalists, I want you to look at the history. I always tell you, I want you to ask people who know the history. Don't listen to it, please, only from one side. I'm begging you. History is there. The records are there to see, to research. Don't make opinions history. And, 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 and let me make it clear. Make it clear. I'm a full believer in democracy. I believe, no matter who and what you are, you have a right to have your political opinion.
opinion. You have a right to express it. That's what I believe in. But you must not express political opinions as fact. Although I know somebody said the truth is what you perceive it to be. Right? But you must not take political opinions as fact. Political opinions is one man's opinion. You must say the other side and come together and say which one is right. So everything I've said this morning, everything I've said this morning, I will go check it out. Yes, Mr. Sifuri. Uh, speaking of politics, um, I can't help but notice that um, um, when in a political climate, let's say there's a lot of empty potholes and uh, a roundabout that's taking a long time to build and um, a long-standing, say, a, a hospital project that's taking a long time to build, it creates a kind of inconvenience politically for a, a, a government in the Westminster model. But when we see the portals being filled near our homes, when we see uh, 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 construction or road construction project. DBS, ask the question today. When, we're taking a, when we see a hospital is almost being finished, it, it begs the question, we have to ask ourselves if there's an election coming up sooner than... Elections we. are due. <laughs> oh, the question is not about when the elections are due, sir. Okay. I was going to tell you. The elections elections are, are due three months after July, after July 26th. Um, as a as an astute student of solution politics, would you um, would you if you were the prime minister, would you advise the prime minister that maybe this year might be a good year to have an election? If my father was a king, I'd be in the palace. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.